Well, we're in Proverbs. Okay, you got your Bibles? Proverbs 31, last chapter of Proverbs. And uh, before we study God's Word, let's ask for His Spirit to guide us. Father, we thank You for this time where we can open Your, your Word and have You speak to us through the printed page. We ask that Your Spirit of Your Son will be here among us to enlighten our minds to hear the real words that you want us to learn today. We pray in his name, amen. Now chapter 31, like chapter 30, it introduces it, it says, now you remember back in chapter 30, it said the words of Agur, the son of Jekka. Well, that's not Solomon. And we think of the Proverbs as being written by Solomon, but he he only wrote 3,000 Proverbs. There were other Proverbs that others wrote. Now, chapter 31 has an introduction, and it sounds like it's somebody else. The words of King Lemuel. Who was King Lemuel? Do you, do you remember Lemuel in the Bible, King Lemuel? That's another name for Solomon. <laughs> so it, makes it, it looks like it might be somebody else, but it's actually Solomon. Pretty good evidence that this is the case. And it says it's a prophecy. Now, what is a prophecy? Does that mean he's going to foretell the future? Not necessarily. What's a prophecy? When somebody prophesies. Who was the first prophet in the Bible, by the way? First time the word prophet is used. Who was it? A little trivial question. Jeopardy. Uh, I want to take $200 for... Prophecy. First prophet in the Bible. Abraham? Who was Abraham? Correct. Ding. You win. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Now, what, what, how was Abraham a prophet? He spoke for God. He, has his, he spoke in, in his favor. And... Um, shared the knowledge of the one true God with everyone, all those people that he, not his own devising, but he ended up witnessing to Abimelech <laughs> because he tried to pawn off Sarah as his sister. And Pharaoh, same thing, repeat. So these were prophecies. He was speaking about God and for him. That his mother taught. Who is Sam, uh, Solomon's mother? Lemuel, Samuel, I almost said Samuel. Who is uh, Solomon's mother? Bathsheba. Bathsheba, that's right. She taught Solomon. You think of other mothers in the Bible that taught their children? Samuel, Hannah taught Samuel, didn't she? How about Jacobed? Twelve years, probably. You think it might be twelve. That seemed to be the magic. No. You have your bar mitzvah and you go off to the palace. <laughs> Mary taught Jesus. Mary taught Jesus. Bathsheba taught Solomon. What, my son? And what, the son of my womb? And what, the son of my vows? Can you hear a Jewish mother speaking this way? <laughs> Give not your strength to women, nor your ways to that which destroys kings. Now, what, what destroys kings? What destroyed Solomon? Too many women. Too many women. Uh, I think she's saying the same thing twice, isn't that? That's a Hebrew parallelism. And you say the same thing in two different ways to drive home the point you're trying to make. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about other things here. And so some have thought that this verse is talking about, well, we're going to talk about uh, women and wine. And that's the name of our, that's the title of the uh, lesson this week, Wine and Women. And in the order in which they're presented here, it's uh, that way. But here she talks about women first. And really that kind of... This says women and wine. Women and wine? Oh, I'm sorry. I was thinking... Uh, the order in which it is in here. But it is, okay, women and wine. And that's the way this verse 
orders it. But then the discussion is actually the reverse order. <laughs> We're going to talk about wine first. And, uh, more than just wine, and strong drink. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. Now, was Lemuel a prince? At one point, he was a prince, wasn't he? Because he was the son of David, the king. Sons of kings are princes. So while he, for, he was a prince in waiting, right? For a, a, he was a king in, well, he was a prince waiting to be a king. And so all these years when she's giving him advice and, and sharing with him how to prepare himself for that position, here's one of the advice, the... Uh, Instruction that she gave to Samuel, uh, to Lemuel, to Solomon. It's not for kings to drink wine or princes strong drink. Why? Well, she's going to ex explain here in the next verse, verse five. Lest here is what happens if you do that: they drink and forget the law. What law? Hmm? God's law. God's law. And how did he give his law? He spoke it. He spoke it. And he wrote it. And, he wrote it. and lived it. <laughs> and then came and lived it, yes, later on. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 17. This is the second book of the law. That's what Deuteronomy means, you know, the second law. Duo. A dynamic duo. How many people in a duo? Two. Two. Anomi, nomis, nomo, uh, normal. Uh, used to have back in the eight, the nineteenth century, girls would go off to a what was called a normal school. You ever heard of that? They would go to a normal school. <laughs> you don't want to go to an abnormal school. But what would they learn in the no normal school? Norms. What are norms? Standards. Standards, rules, laws of etiquette and proper conduct. Laws. Anyway, it's, it has to do with yes. law. Did we see a, a school down in Australia that said normal school? Yes. Yes, it, it's a you know, British term. Yeah. Okay, Deuteronomy 17. You all there? Yes. Uh, let's go to verse 14. Now, God knew that in time, Israel was going to have kings. It was not his plan that they have kings. He was their king, right? Yes. They were under his rule and his guidance and his direction and his judgments. But he knew, he says, verse 14, when you are come into the land when the Lord thy God, uh, which the Lord thy God shall give thee, and you shall possess it and shall dwell therein, you will say, I will set a king over me. You're going to say this. And did they? Yeah, yeah, they did. Why did they want a king? Everybody else had a king. We want to be like the, other, the rest of the people. And what did kings do for those people? <laughs> Took their own possessions, their money, everything. That's what Samuel told them later on. God told Samuel to tell them this is what's going to happen. Uh, I'll give you due notice. We still want it. We still want it. Yeah. Uh, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are about me. See, I want to be like everybody. I want to be like the Joneses. I want to be like the Amalekites. I want to be like the Philistines. And uh, you shall in any wise set him a king uh, Thou shalt in any way set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. You don't can't just choose anybody. It's got to be God's choice. From among your brethren. You don't, don't want to have a foreigner in there ruling over you. You want to have people of your own kin folk. Okay. And uh, no stranger over you. Verse 16. But he shall not multiply horses to himself. Now, we translate that today. We'd say, he shall not uh, multiply tanks 
and battleships. And he's not going to build up a big army and a navy and you know, homeland defense. <laughs> because even though you may have a king here on earth, I'm still your protection. I'm still the one who is to rule over you. Nor cause the people to return to Egypt. Oh, my. What had, did they do that? Only in their time, ultimately, Egypt became Babylon. But Egypt was a symbol of going back to slavery. And when they went to Babylon, they, were, they weren't free people, were they? They were subject to the kings of Babylon. And so on. Now, let, let's get down to what we want to talk about. Verse 17. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself. Oh, my. How many wives did David have? More than one. Bathsheba seems to be the last one, though. She was the last one mentioned. Hung in there to the, to the end. But Michael, Saul's daughter, Abigail, huh? Naboth. Na Naboth's uh, wife. Naboth, no, Nabal. Nabal. Naboth, Naboth had the vineyard. <laughs> That's right, he had Nabal's wife. And there's more, there was more. Uh, Absalom's mother, who was also Adonijah's mother, Starts with an H. I have to look it up. But anyway, he had a lot of wives. Now, more than Saul had, and then Solomon comes along. Boy, he really multiplied wives to himself. That his heart turned not away. Away from what? From God. What happened when Solomon multiplied wives to himself? Where did they come from? Yeah, they came from all these other countries all around there, all these other foreign pagan tribes and pagans. Countries. And they, they brought with them Idols. their gods. Their gods. Yeah. And it turned his heart away from the God of heaven. Neither shall he greatly multiply himself silver and gold. Well, he got plenty of that. And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book. Now, there's the verse I wanted to get to. We're talking about kings, and Bathsheba's given advice to her son, who is now king, King Lemuel, Solomon. And she says, don't give your strength to women, lest, verse 5, you drink. Well, wine, women, and song go together, and we always say that. But, uh, and forget the law. Now, he had a responsibility to, to read this law. Let's read on here. Out of which is before the priests, the Levites, and it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life. This was the responsibility, requirement of every king. They were to read the book of the law. Now, what was the book of the law? It was everything else. After the Ten Commandments, you had all these other statutes and judgments and uh, testimonies. And Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, all those. Yeah, the Book of the Laws actually includes up through Psalms. Psalm, part of Psalms is called the Book of the Law. In fact, if you go to Psalm, where is it here? Psalm 90? Is it 90? Where is it? There's a transition in here. And it says... In my book, it says, Book 4, the Numbers Book Concerning Israel and the Nation. Oh, wait a minute, that's not the one. Okay, one more. Where's Book 5? Nineteen has a lot about the law, of course. It's just four books. Anyway, this to get divisions in here. I thought it was the one that said the book of the law. <laughs> the 
Leviticus book concerning the sanctuary, book three. That starts with Psalm 73. Do you have those uh, divisions in your Bibles? Somebody put these in here. Book three. Where's book two? Anyway, it's kind of interesting how they divide this up. But, um, there's a lot. It talks about the law in, in Psalms as well. So David had even contributed to a lot of commentary on the law. And they were to read this book of the law. This was the writings of Moses that had been put in the side of the ark. You had the Ten Commandments inside the ark and the book of the law in the side of the ark, which a copy of was given to the king. And he was to read it all the days of his life. And uh, what would happen if he drinks? He's going to forget the law. He's going to forget what he just said. He's going to forget the night before. He's going to forget. He can't remember anything. Is that what happens? Yeah. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, verse 6. Right. And, and also, and prevent his judgment. Prevent his judgment. That's right. He will not be able to think clearly and make proper choices. Now, we're going to talk about the effects of alcohol on the frontal cortex. Now, alcohol actually affects every organ in the body. It, it, it's absorbed rapidly after drinking it. Uh, actually begins absorption in the mouth <laughs> and before it even gets to the stomach. And uh, very quickly goes right straight to the liver. Oh, man, you ever, you ever heard about uh, the connection between alcohol and liver? Everybody knows about that, right? That's where it has to be detoxified. Alcohol is damaging to cells. It's actually used as a preservative. When, we, when you take uh, uh, tissue specimens and you send it off to the lab, you put it in alcohol. Because it immediately, special ethyl alcohol, because it will, it's very uh, drying. It takes the water right out of the tissues. And so that it, it preserves it. Uh, embalming. <laughs> Oh, let me give you a little, uh, here's some of the biochemistry of alcohol. Uh, ethyl alcohol is just one type of alcohol. Anything that has a saturated carbon atom and an hydroxyl group on it, that's an OH, and a hydrogen on this side. Carbons have four bonds. So you got uh, carbon chains. You're going to have carbons on either side of the carbon. So that takes up two, two bonds. Then you've got the hydroxyl group and the hydrogen group. And that's an alcohol. You ever see that formation? Well, there's lots of things. In fact, glucose technically is a type of alcohol. It has that configuration as part of it. Uh, ethyl alcohol is intoxicating because when it goes to the liver, uh, it, the liver has to quickly transform it into something else because that alcohol, it, it, it's killing cells all along the line, pickling the sides of your throat and the esophagus. That's why esophageal cancer is very uh, high risk, as well as stomach cancer and liver cancer and pancreatic cancer. These are all cancers uh, risk from alcohol. But in the uh, liver, it's broken down into acetaldehyde and... Acetic acid. What's acetic acid? No, that's acetosalicylic acid. Oh, acetic acid. Vinegar. Vinegar. So it's broken down into vinegar. Now, what happens? What, what is vinegar called? What did they give Jesus on the cross? Oh. And vinegar. It's cheap wine called, called that. It's not as doesn't have the uh, inebriating, intoxicating capabilities as straight ethanol, eth ethyl alcohol, but uh, can have a numbing effect on the senses to some degree. And one of the reasons why I guess we're good advised not to eat, eat a lot of pickles, at least uh, vinegar cured pickles. I guess salt pickles, maybe you have salt cured pickles. Uh, 
Jesus refused it. You remember, when he realized what it was, he didn't take it. Acetaldehyde, that's, uh, that's the toxic ingredient, ethyl, uh, ethanol. There's other kinds of uh, alcohols. Methanol, you heard of that one? Methanol, it's called wood alcohol. Uh, you hear a lot about it in racing, car racing. They'll use it as an additive to fuel. Uh, you can uh, uh, increase the uh, vaporization of the fuel, and so you can get a higher octane rating. But it's very poisonous. If you drink that, uh, it can cause blindness. And the, uh, it's broken down in the liver into formaldehyde, now, what do you use formaldehyde for? Embalming. Embalming corpses. That's right. Okay, so the, that takes on a whole new meaning to the, uh, the phrase pickling your brain, right? And uh, formaldehyde and formic acid. What's formic acid? You, you know, you're familiar with Have you ever had uh, an ant bite, a sting, uh, a, a bee sting, wasp sting, all those stinging insects? That sting, venom, is formic acid. And that's what causes the blindness and death. Uh, methanol, you drink methanol, that can, that's deadly. Rubbing alcohol, isopropyl alcohol. Stuff you can get at the drugstore, you know, and you put it on your skin and it evaporates very quickly and, and feels cold. Well, some, some people, uh, when they can't get alcohol any other way, sometimes they'd come into the ER and they'd been drinking rubbing alcohol, isopropyl alcohol. That's metabolized to acetone. Fingernail polish. You're going to drink that? Fingernail polish remover. Fingernail polish remover. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not. Anyway, uh, it's a CNS depressant. Alcohol affects the brain as well as a lot of other organs. Um, okay, we talked about all of that. Now, in the Bible, where, where did we first see alcohol affecting people? It's judgment and uh, incapacitating them. Noah, he grew some grapes, grew in a vine, vineyard, a small vineyard, I guess, but enough to make some wine, and uh, he didn't know what was going on. Woe to him. This is Isaiah 5, verse 1. Isaiah 5, verse 1. Woe to him who rises early to drink or stay up late till they are inflamed with wine. And uh, Ephesians 5.18. Well, these are all five. Isaiah 5, Ephesians 5.18. Those who are drunk on wine instead of filled with the Spirit. Well, actually, drunk on spirits instead of filled with the Spirit. It's kind of a play on words, I guess. There's different kinds of spirits, aren't there? Uh, Galatians 5.19. 2021, drunkenness and orgies are acts of a sinful nature. This effect, before you pickle your brain <laughs> entirely, it turns off portions of the brain. And the first ones to be affected is the frontal lobe. You can have the bottle in front of you or the frontal lobotomy. <laughs> frontal a frontal, yeah, that's a bottle in front of me or a frontal lobotomy. That was it. <laughs> it didn't sound right. I uh, got it to rhyme right. The bottle in front of me, it causes a frontal lobotomy is, is what we're trying to point out. Why the frontal lobe? What's, what's your frontal lobes do? Reason. Reason, judgment, insight, decision making. Yeah. This is really where your personality is. Uh, there was, I learned this at the, the meetings that we just went to the uh, first part of this week, Monday and Tuesday, uh, lifestyle center organizational meeting, and we got to hear from people that are having, that have lifestyle centers, and they're doing this work, and uh, sharing their experiences and their knowledge, and one of the things uh, that got me really excited was uh, a fellow that's actually training people to do uh, this work. He has a school. And so I went online and saw one of his movies, his videos. 
and he told about Phineas Gage. Anybody heard about Phineas Gage? You know all this stuff. You know everything. That... Phineas Gage. You... Oh, yeah, Jason knows him too. Well, this is back in the 1800s, and uh, he was working on the railroads. And you know, laying the railroads, going across country, transcontinental railroad, and you'd have to level out the, the going through the mountain passes and where there's rock outcroppings, and they'd have to do blasting and everything. And he was on the blasting team. And you'd drill a hole, and after these drills, and uh, you'd put dynamite down in there, and then you'd uh, put some uh, sawdust and stuff on top of it with the fuse coming out, and you'd tamp it gently. Uh, uh, but you have to have some compression on top of that so it'll explode out this way and break the rock and not just go up that way. Well, he's tamping the thing down and not paying attention and the thing went off and it drove this tamping rod, which is steel, right up underneath his jaw here, went up through, took out his eye and went out the top of his skull 35 feet away. It landed. Amazingly, he lived. But he was never the same after that. Why? His personality was drastically altered. Frontal lobe, gone. He had a self-inflicted frontal lobotomy, and not the chemical one that we were just talking about. This is a mechanical. You, know, you just took out that part of his brain. But he was not the same. His wife left him. I just couldn't stand him anymore. He, was, he used to be a nice, gentle man. And now he was a rascal and just ornery and <laughs> completely changed him. So that's, this is the effect when you don't in control of your frontal lobe and reasoning power. And that's why Bathsheba is advising King Lemuel, her son, that you will forget not only the law, you're going to forget how to judge properly. You're not going to be in full uh, control of your mental faculties. Then we have verse 6. Give strong drink to him that is ready to perish. And then we, we were talking about Jesus. They gave vinegar. Well, that wasn't really strong drink. That was weak wine. Uh, this brings up a, an interesting subject. <laughs> uh, wine. The use of wine in the Bible. Was the wine that Jesus said at the Last Supper a symbol of his shed blood? Was it fermented? No. The bread, the other symbol, was unleavened. What does unleavened mean? Now, I... Huh? It means removing the sin portion. And also, the original Hebrew there means unfermented thing. It doesn't even say bread. It says unfermented things uh, that they should eat. And the rabbi, in the Mishnah, no, no, not the Mishnah. What's the, uh, where's the other one? The Talmud? Talmud and the Mishnah. One of them, anyway. I found this old book on Google Books. And it's called the uh, Temperance Bible. You go, go to Google Books and type in Temperance Bible. It was written in 1824, I think. And they have a whole section in there on, on how the, the wine of the Lord's Supper was prepared by the Jews uh, in Passover. And they would use raisins because uh, grapes weren't in season until the end of the year. Grape harvest is in the fall and Passover is in the spring and you don't have any fresh grapes. You remember the, uh, the wedding at Canaan. That was in the winter. And they didn't have any fresh grapes, probably, left over at that time. But they'd have raisins. And so they would soak the raisins in water. And, and uh, sometimes they would even boil the water to get all of the uh, flavor and juice out of the raisins. And they'd have raisin water. Now, when we were in Africa... <laughs> We had a communion service out in the, well, it wasn't bush. They actually had a, a brick church, and it was whitewashed, and it was a pretty nice church. But we had communion there, and uh, we had raisin water. We didn't have grape juice. They didn't have Welch's. <laughs> there was no store around there. If they had stores, they were very expensive. Oh, yeah. You wouldn't, oh, yeah. 
uh, but they had raisin water. And this first, so we had brown, really didn't have the, the color symbolism of blood, but it was the closest thing they had. So we, we experienced that. And that's the way they would do it in the Bible times. And the, uh, I think it is the Mishnah that describes how they would do this. And it says the rabbins, I thought it was rabbis, but they said rabbins uh, advised that the, the unfermented, the real Hebrew word says unfermented things, they applied that not only to the unleavened bread, yeast ferments, right? That's why you have no yeast leaven in there because it ferments the starches in the bread into alcohol. And you know the advice not to eat hot bread, warm bread, because it's dead. the alcohol is still in there. Uh, let it cool and evaporate off um, if you have yeast in the bread. If you have unleavened bread, then no worry. But they extended that not only from the unleavened bread, but also to the unfermented raisin water, <laughs> wine. So I, was, I, I found that very interesting. Um, we've got some time left. We ought to, oh, oh, here it is. I did write it down here. This is uh, Gobat's Journal in Abyssinia, published in London, 1814, page 223 and 345. You, you want to make a note of that if you want to look it up. <laughs> Body was pure. Yes, without sin, uncorrupted. Un, it's the ferment, fermentation is a breakdown and a, a corruption of the natural. Uh, in Isaiah, let, let, we, we've got time to look at this. I think it's very interesting. Isaiah 65, next to the last chapter in Isaiah, verse 8. <coughs> Thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster. What cluster? Grape cluster. A cluster of grapes. So is a cluster of grapes fermented or unfermented? Fermented. That's, that's the raw, natural grape. And uh, that's the new wine. So fresh grape juice is called here new wine. And the Lord says, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it. So that's uh, another text that is of interest in this uh, setting. Okay, now we want to look at, let's start with verse 10. We're going to talk about women now. And this is a, a virtuous woman. You know a virtuous woman? What, what is a virtuous woman? Virtue is its own reward. That's the only thing I can think of. <laughs> when we ever use the word virtue, how often do you use the word virtue in your everyday language? When you talk to people, you ever say virtue? Not much. Not much. <laughs> Patience, is Patience is a virtue. Yeah. <coughs> well, virtue must be a good thing, isn't it? So a virtuous woman is a good woman. Do you know any good women? I do. Yeah. Sure. For her price is far above rubies. Oh, well, this is a favorite saying of uh, Solomon. And I, I, remember I had uh, chapter 8, Sabbath school lesson, and we did Proverbs chapter 8. And back in chapter 8, verse uh, two, four, no, which is it? Verse 11. Proverbs 8, verse 11. For wisdom is better than rubies. A virtuous woman whose worth exceeds, is beyond rubies. So she must have wisdom, too. Yeah, because wisdom is above rubies. The price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her. He can give her the checkbook and not worry. She tr he trusts her. She's wise. She's going to use that like a virtuous woman would use it. She, she is a virtuous woman. And so he shall have no need of spoil. He won't. <laughs> What's spoil? When uh, somebody goes into battle to fight somebody else and you win, you get the spoils. Well, what happens if uh, you have to go battle with your wife 
over the checkbook. <laughs> you won't have no need to spoil, okay? Because uh, he can trust her. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. That's a virtuous woman. That's a good woman. She does him good. She seeks wool and flax. What for? What does she need wool and flax for? What do you make out of it? Like clothes. Yeah. Flax. Where do you think of flax in the Bible? You think of a Bible story where flax was used? Several times. Flax. Was that what was the straw that was on top of the, the house where uh, the spies? Where she hid the spies. Where she hid the spies. Who, who's she? Rahab. Rahab. <laughs> Rahab had a big supply of flax up on top of her flat on the wall. Hid those spies underneath those bundles of flax. Hadn't been made into, she hadn't woven it into, what do you make flax Linen. into? Linen. That's right. So she made, she was a tablecloth maker, right? <laughs> linen tablecloths. That's the only thing I think of made out of linen anymore. But they made gowns. They made garments out of flax as well. So she was industrious. Was she a virtuous woman? Yeah, in her work. Wool and flax. You make a... Uh, Yarn out of wool. She willingly works with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. <laughs> yeah, any of you know of uh, women who make merchant trips down to the big city to load up their caravan with food? Two. Yeah, when you're going that far, you better get two. <laughs> That's right. We're, we're trying to cut the ex tra transportation costs in half by, getting twice, by getting twice what you normally get. And then that way, you don't have to go back, back again a second time. So now, one trip, you cut your transportation costs. That's a, okay, she goes for far and she brings food from afar, boxes of it. And so the, uh, the car pulls up, and she's been to the store, and she's loaded up, and i got to go out there and help haul in all these boxes of food. That's, that's a virtuous woman, right? She rises up while it is yet night. Now, this time of day, since the time changed, it really is true. <laughs> We're getting up, and it's dark outside. And she gets meat, gets food for her household and a portion to her maidens. She's right there starting the day off early so everyone else can get their day started. And she considers a field and buys it, and fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She's a forward thinking. I'm planning ahead. You know, we don't have enough grapes. <laughs> we, need enough, we need a vineyard. And I don't have room. We, we got garden taking up all the land we got now. That should be a nice place for a vineyard over there. And it becomes available, and she negotiates and gets the deal, and she's thinking ahead, planning ahead. She girds her loins with strength and strengthens her arms. She preserves that perceives that her merchandise is good. Her candle goes not out at night. She's burning the candle into the night hours. <laughs> what is it? A man's work is from sun to sun. Woman's sunrise sun to, sun to set sun. of sun. Yeah. You've got to end with sun for it to rhyme. Sun to sun. Sun to sun. Oh, but one of woman's work is never done. Okay, yeah, that, all right. Sometimes she burns it on both ends of that candle. She lays her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. That must be part of the spinning loom, huh? Spinning wheel. I mean, what's the distaff? I mean, she got her hand on the spindle. She's turning it, and then this thing you have to, you you kind of twirl the thread as it's coming off and it winds itself around the spindle. Uh, she stretches out her hand to the poor. She's meeting everybody's needs, not just the family's needs, but others that she sees needs help. 
reaches forth her hand to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. <laughs> wow, what's that talking about? Well, the point says the best. The best. Yeah, that's what it has in the margin here. Okay, she's not afraid of the snow because she's prepared for it. See, they've got good, warm clothing that she's made herself. Went and sh shorn those sheep and made that, combed that wool and made that yarn and wove those cloths. And <laughs> this is a one-woman shop from start to finish. She makes herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Wow, and it's not just plain stuff. This is nice. This is nice clothing. Her husband is known in the gates. Boy, I've got a virtuous woman. <laughs> and he's known. She's made him famous. When he sits among the elders of the land, she makes fine linen and sells it, delivers girdles to the merchants, and strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom. Yep. Wisdom is above rubies. She's got that too, right? She's above rubies. And in her tongue is the law of kindness. So she's, she's got wisdom, but she doesn't flaunt it. She's kind in her use of her wisdom. She looks well to the ways of her household and eats not the bread of idleness. Who no. She's busy every moment. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he, and he praises her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but you excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. There's inner beauty and outer beauty. Now, the outer beauty is transient. You lived long enough to see that uh, American Idol is constantly changing, <laughs> right? And uh, the movie stars of today have replaced the ones of yesterday. They don't look, they last for very long. Somebody else comes along. It's got more youthful looking face. We don't need you anymore. Oh, we'll use you for a character actor. <laughs> the old person. <laughs> Beauty is vain. But a woman and uh, that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Now, we've got a few minutes left. And we've gone through this verse by verse. We've read this whole section. And in my mind, when I read this the first time, I'm thinking of a virtuous woman. But what is a woman in Scripture? Church. 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 Let's go back to verse 10 and look at this again. And think how this could be applied to God's people. All of us not just those of the female persuasion. <laughs> Who can find a good church? That's, that is a challenge, isn't it? Not only for those who are seeking, but for those who are identify themselves as being part of a church. It is a it is a solemn responsibility to present yourself as a good, virtuous woman, representing your husband. Who is your husband as a church? Jesus. Yeah, we have a song. Oh, man. Is thy husband the Lord of hosts is his name? No, how does it start out? What's the first word? <coughs> Is I husband? Oh man, it's in Isaiah. <laughs> um, anyway, there's a verse in Isaiah. That says the, the is it Jehovah? No. 
God is thy husband, the Lord of hosts is his name? I don't think it's God. Is that, there's two so I've got a couple of so is thy husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. Da, 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 of Israel. I remember that word. <laughs> anyway, uh, you representing your husband, the Lord of hosts. That's a solemn responsibility. And if he finds a virtuous woman, his church, her value to him is above rubies. We can be part of that church. Ellen White makes this famous statement, God has his church. It is not the ecclesiastical institution. It is not the great cathedral. It is not the denominations. But it is the, his people who trust in him and keep his commandments. I think the first uh, creed that was printed on the uh, Review and Herald, James White put on there, he decided that he needed to put some statement of what, what we believe. And the very first one he put on was, oh, I think you know, it was uh, at their organization meeting in 1861. And they didn't want to have a creed. So he says, let's have a covenant. <coughs> Revelation 14.12. Have you ever heard of Revelation1412.org? Mm -hmm. That's where they, they took a, their name for that website, and their ministry is taken from this verse. Here is the patience of the saints. Now, that's, okay, verse 12. Here are they that keep the commandments of God, the Father, and the faith of Jesus Christ, the Son. Right? you got the commandments of the Father and the faith of Jesus, the Son. And that's what he had on his masthead there for a while before they started adding to it. I said, well, we also believe, well, the Sabbath is part of the commandments. Man, everything's, you know, it kind of covered everything in their minds. And so he can trust her, right? Verse 11, he can trust his church. She will do him good as a people. We will... Speak well of our husband, our heavenly master. You have one master, Jesus said to his disciples, and all ye are brothers. brethren. Yes, brothers. And you would do him good all the days of your life. For the church will gather up the things that need to be put together to meet the needs of the members and the world. So, talks about her family. She's going to prepare, prepare food. What's the food that we prepare? The word. the word, right? We feed on the word. We prepare the food. He gets up early. They're industrious. They, they look for new opportunities to expand their work and to build up. Oh, she girds her loins and with strength, the, and strengthens her arms. How many arms do you have? Two. Two. What's the right arm of the message? We just went to meetings here, first part of the week. The health work, health education, health treatment, health ministry, medical ministry work. This is the health, right arm of the message. What's the left arm of the message? Preaching of the word. The gospel. Gospel and health, they go together. Uh, her can she preserves with her merchandise is good, and, she, and she's working day and night. This is a, a round-the-clock effort for the church, isn't it? And uh, she lays her hands, and she's working, stretching out her hand to the poor. We're, we're looking to how to meet the needs of those who don't have, because the first thing, the first work, is to meet people where they are. Wasn't that what Jesus, uh, Ellen White said, that Jesus would go into a village and he met people where they were, their, met their needs, and then he would explain to them and open the truths of the kingdom. He'd heal them, relieve them of their suffering, 
their pain. Uh, give them the food they need and then feed them with the word. Not afraid of the snow. She makes herself coverings. The husband has known the gate. The Lord is going to be honored by his church. We're, we're going through this virtuous woman a second time. Now looking at it as the church, this woman that uh, is the bride of Christ. <clears throat> she has wisdom. She speaks kind, with kindness. Her children rise up, call her blessed, and her husband praises her. Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. He blesses, right? Blessed of my father. For it is the fa your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. <clears throat> Many daughters have done virtuously, but you excel them all. <clears throat> well, we can look at, um, look at these things in the Bible in more than one way, can we? <clears throat> A virtuous woman and uh, Christ's virtuous woman. I show you a great mystery, Paul said in Ephesians 6. Hmm? Or is it 5? Five? 5. I show you a great mystery. Christ has given himself for the church. They shall be, a man shall leave his. Mother and woman, and they shall become one flesh. This is the great mystery. And I speak concerning Christ and his church. Let's talk about this, this woman. Well, <clears throat> our time is up. Let's pray as we close. Father, we thank you for these words of wisdom, words of uh, challenge to us that we will keep our minds clear and free of any numbing influence, that we may make good judgment, that we may represent you in all things, that you will rise up and call us blessed. Thank you for giving us your son. He made all this possible, and we pray this in his name. Amen.